Hi, this is Randy Kay from WSHU. We're an NPR affiliate located on the campus of Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. And hey, check out some of the highlights of my interview today with the wonderful John Ratzenberger. Hey, all right. All right, here's a little known fact. Your smartest animal? Yeah. It's the pig. What? Hey, they look Dolphin. pretty stupid. No, 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 I'm telling you, your average oinker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scientists say if a pig had thumbs in a language, he could be trained to do uh, simple manual labor. You mean they'd be part of the workforce? Yeah, yeah, they give you 20, 30 years of loyal service, then at the retirement dinner, uh, you could eat them. <laughs> That, of course, was Cliff Clavin, who just reminded me to unmute my microphone. That was John Ratzenberger. I am Randy Kay from WSHU, here in support with John Ratzenberger, who we'll bring in in a moment. And that's in support of National Day of Giving. He is part of our WSHU and SHU family, the Shoe family. You may know him from Cheers. My husband and I are binge watching from season one and absolutely in awe. But you also may know him from his wonderful work with Pixar. Probably all copper wiring, huh? So, uh, where are you from? Singapore? Ah, uh, guys, I've been looking all over for you. <laughs> Flaming Death is a huge hit! PT. I'm serious, word of mouth got PT, around. No. The next day, there was a line of flies outside the tent. Who went on forever? It must have been a foot long! Shh, PT, no! So, I figured it out. You... Uh, all right, nobody look till I get my cork back in. Oh, John plays in every single Pixar film. It's kind of a good luck for Pixar. We're going to talk with him in a moment and find out how that happened. Uh, let me bring him in right now. John, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, yeah. Good, good day. Good morning, wherever you're sitting in front of your computer. Something. If, uh... I'm, in, I'm in California, so it's good morning for, to me. It's nine o'clock here. Well, very good morning to you. It's 12 o'clock for us and for anybody listening, whatever time it is for you, I'm so glad you're joining us. John, I, I want to first talk to you about, we have a lot to talk about today, but you know, people who know you're from Cheers may think, oh, where'd this guy come from? He's an overnight success. He just auditioned for a part and got it. Can you start? We'll talk a little bit later about your early life and your experience at SHU, but I want to start now with your acting career. Can you tell us a bit about what brought you from wanting to be an actor to the experience that led you to get your, your I guess, your first really big part, which was Cliff Clavin on Cheers. Can you tell us about that, including your improv experience? Well, how much time do we have? Uh, 40 minutes. Uh, you don't, <laughs> not nearly enough time to, to do that story justice. I uh, It was actually people in my life that uh, that caused me to you know, to, to be that wandering uh, ball in a pinball machine, it was the bumpers that I hit. And the first one uh, was a shoe alum named Al DeFabio. Now, Al uh, worked in the same grocery store I worked in, in Fairfield, Connecticut. It was the Grand Union. And um, he... Oh, I remember uh, that Grand Union on the Post Road, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right, that's right, right where I think Bob's is there now. Yes, it is. Uh, but in any case, uh, Al saw something in me I didn't see because uh, upon graduation from high school, I was going to go into the Marine Corps. And uh, Al talked me into making an attempt to see if I could um, get into Sacred Heart. So finally, I did. I think more than, more just to keep him quiet, really. <laughs> All and, right, I'll go to college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Didn't think I'd ever make it, but I did. And uh, lo and behold, uh, then my whole life changed. Uh, Al, uh, Al was involved in the drama thing, and uh, uh, that's where all the pretty girls were. So I thought, why not give it a shot? It's a great motivator. Absolutely. That's, that's what makes the world go round. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's how I started in drama. Um uh, I, I tried out for a play, and I got the understudy for the lead in Summer and Smoke. And uh, 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 I thought this is great because I could just fool around backstage, goof, go to the parties, whatnot. Flirt. I didn't even, what? Flirt. 
flirt, absolutely. <laughs> so I didn't. I hadn't even read the play, and then the lead of the play quit the night before opening night. What? And uh, and and Dr. Lee, that was the drama teacher's name, Dr. Lee, Dr. Florence Lee, I believe. And uh, anyway, she said, "Well, John, you're on tomorrow night." <laughs> And my blood just rushed right out of my body. I, I I couldn't even comprehend. I hadn't paid any attention. <laughs> I didn't know the blocking. I didn't know the play. I had no idea. And I've got 24 hours to pull this together. Oh, my God. So with the help of the, the script lady, uh, Phyllis Wilcox, uh, did as much as I could that, the whole next day. Read the play, did some blocking, this and that. But obviously, I didn't know. So the curtain goes up, and uh, there I am, and she's Phyllis is just off the curtain, shouting in in a whisper, <laughs> in the loudest whisper she could manage, the lines. And I literally was on stage doing this. What? What? Oh my God. I got, and I stumbled. <clears throat> I, I stumbled through the first half. And then the second part, I said, no, I, I, this is nonsense. So I started making up my own lines. <laughs> and, which, and she's in the wings going, no, that's not right. What's that? She's in the wings going, oh, no, that can't be right. I think, no, I don't think she said a thing. I think she just put her head down and was shaking her head. <laughs> it, it's, it's like you see the ship sinking. There's nothing you can do. Uh, but I, the audience started to laugh. And so I fed into the laughter. I said, oh, okay, I get it. So I turned Summer and Smoke, which is a high uh, uh, drama, uh, into a farce. The, oh. other, the, other actors, the other actors were furious, obviously, because I, I wasn't feeding them their lines. I was just, I was just trying to get off the stage <laughs> and get to the end of the play. But at the end of it, uh, uh, another fellow came up to me and said, he said, you really have a gift for improvisation. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, I I've read Summer and Smoke. I, I know the lines. And it was Claude McNeil. Oh. Who, who was just starting to uh, take over the drama department there at Sacred Heart. And then uh, it was there I met Ray Hassett, my uh, improvised comedy partner, that uh, he and I ended up over in England. He went first. He was the pioneer. And... Uh, and I, after enough postcards from him, I was working as a carpenter up in North Vermont, and I got a, uh, a tax refund check that exactly covered the one-way fare to uh, oh. London. I stayed in care. So I went. I was, I was only going to visit Ray for a week. I ended up staying ten years, and uh, wow. we, tra we traveled all through Europe um, as Sal's Meat Market doing our own brand of improvised comedy. Just the two of you. It was just the two of you. Yeah. So it wasn't. Yeah. So this, wow, 10 years, you improvised your entire decade, basically. Oh, I'm still old. improvising. <laughs> so tell me how this, wow, 10 years of doing that, you really were in the trenches living the improv life, probably in so many ways on stage and off. Now, how did that, how did you get from that to auditioning for Cheers, and how did you get the role of Cliff? Oh, well, um, I have to fast forward in my head here a little. Um, after after uh, touring Europe and this and that, we uh, Ray went off uh, to the States. Uh, he actually became a highly decorated uh, police uh, detective for the New Haven Police Department. Oh, and he's still working with law enforcement now. The State Department has him traveling the world, teaching other police forces uh, de-escalation techniques of how to de-escalate a situation. So that's Ray is still doing improv. Uh, yeah, and that, but he's he's he he was saving lives in real life, and uh, I was making people laugh. But uh, I got hired to write a sitcom for CBS with uh, a gal named Ruby Wax. And we uh, 
She was a, a story editor for Absolutely Fabulous. It was a show wow. on the BBC. So yep. you know, I went to London. I'm sorry, I went to Los Angeles <clears throat> to write this sitcom. And it was a sitcom based on the life of the Emperor Nero. <laughs> but at the end of that process, that's a long story in itself. But uh, there was, someone told me that they were auditioning at... Paramount Studios, uh, some show that's set in a bar uh, in New England. And the guy said, you're from New England. I just said, yeah, yeah. I've actually been in a bar. <laughs> so I went in and I had, see, I had never auditioned once in my life up until that point. And I had already been working 10 years. I'd done films, Bridge Too Far, Empire Strikes Back, and I've done close to 30 films over in Europe, plus the shows that Ray and I did, plus other shows. But we were always hired because everybody knew who we were. Wow. I'm going to stop you there for one second because I think we have a clip of you. So you did Star Wars before you did Cheers? Oh, yeah. Wow. Do we have a clip of that to show a little bit of, of your work on there? I don't. Here we go. I'm getting a thumbs up, and that's all I see. Okay. <laughs> I should keep talking because we don't have the clip. But we all right. So we so Star Wars. So so there you are. You've just work has somehow fallen into your lap, and here you are going oh, no. on your no, first no. I, I work. I worked for it. Now, but you didn't uh, audition. No, you know, what I would do was I was at the studios, uh, whether it's Pinewood Studios or L Street. I would wander down to the carpentry shop. And I'd find out from the carpenters what sets they were building. What was the next thing coming in? Because they they know way before the casting directors and the agents know because they have to build the sets for whatever, they're, whether it's Superman, uh, Empire Strikes Back, uh, Bridge Too Far, Valentino. So I was in all of those. But, it's, beca but it's because I was my background as a carpenter I knew that they had to start building the sets long before word of the film actually got out. So I would give my agent a heads up. And he'd, he'd always say, how do you know? How do you? I said, talk to the carpenters. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, uh, I ended up doing, yeah, close to 30 films uh, while wow. I was over there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's also awesome. So let's bring it back to Cheers and how all this improvising. I understand there was some improv involved in getting and developing this character. Can you talk to us about that? Well, they yeah, they had me in and I just thought it was to chat. Uh, but they said, well, you're here to audition. And I thought, oh, my God. And I didn't want to say you, you never say, hey, I can't. Right. So I gave him my best shot, but it was horrible. I, I don't understand the audition process. <laughs> to, to this day, I don't understand. What, what role were you auditioning for? Oh, I forget. I don't know. Oh. A, role, a, a, a role that I wasn't suited for. I heard it was Norm. No, is that not true? Were no, you the, 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 there was no Norm at that time either. There was... I, they were just I, figuring out characters and they just. Yeah, because at the beginning, they had a lot of different guys around the bar. If you see the first uh, year of the show, you'll see that there's a lot of this, about a half a dozen different guys wandering in and out. Right. And so it was, I guess, something that they had printed up for that. And uh, I, I failed. So, but as I was walking out the door, I started thinking as a writer and I said, Do you have a bar know it all? And uh, it was Glenn Charles. He said, what are, you, what are you talking about? So I just turned around and walked back in their office. I said, come on, you know, the kind of guy who, and I, I think I picked up a pen off of his desk and started talking about the invention of the ballpoint pen <laughs> and, and, and the Beach Brothers. And this is all true, by the way. The Big Pen Company, there's the two brothers, they're named uh, Beach, B-I-C-H. And someone mentioned to them, you probably don't want to name your company the Beach Company for obvious reasons. So they took out the H and called it Bic. 
So I think I did. I think I did that story plus a variation on that. Whatever. But all mm-hmm. I wanted to do was to make them laugh, so I could leave with my dignity. And uh, <laughs> two days later, I was literally, I had my suitcase on the bed, packing, ready to go back home to London. And uh, boom, I got the call. The bar that my father frequented down in Black Rock uh, had one of those characters in there. A guy that thought he knew everything. And even as a kid, you know, this is back when when you're nine, ten years old, you can go, you know, have some potato chips while your father's belly it up to the bar. <laughs> and uh, But it used to crack me up, this guy, because people would ask him questions. And even at that young age, I knew that he was full of it. But it just, I always thought that character was funny. Yeah, absolutely. And I, <clears throat> I want to ask you one more question about Cheers. And then I'd really like to hear more about your life as a Sacred Heart student. Uh, you've told us quite a bit already, which is great. And I know Claude McNeil went on to create Downtown Cabaret Theater, I believe. So there's a lot of local, there's a lot of local in you. Uh, let's talk about Cliff for one more second. So as an improviser and writer and actor, Tell us about your performance process of, of developing the character of Cliff. At, how many seasons uh, of Cheers were there? I, I was, I, I'm sorry. I, it always cracks me up. Oh, oh, actor talk. Tell me about the pro- I don't have a <laughs> I don't have a process. No. I show up, I do my job, and I go home. That's a process, isn't That's, it? Yeah, I find my way to wherever it is. <laughs> I'm the only, I was told, because I've done a lot of, you know, stage work. Right. And I, a lot of actors have told me that I'm the only actor they've ever seen seconds before he goes on stage fully asleep. <laughs> I, I sit backstage, I'll, I'll nod off. Because it's all in God's hands at that point. Yeah. You've done the best you could do, memorizing and this and that and, you know, but what's to get nervous about? Is take a nap. Somebody will wake you up when it's your turn. You go. So I, I my process is just to the, the people that paid the money to get in to entertain them somehow. That's that's the you, you're 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 of service. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not about you. It's about those people in the audience. They might have been standing out in the rain or the cold or ninety degrees sun. But you got to take all that into consideration when you're on stage. Mm-hmm. But that's all started at Sacred Heart. As a matter of fact, there was one show I did, Sacred Heart, where I slept on the stage at night. Everybody else left. Nobody knew that I was still in the theater. And I would roll out my sleeping bag in the middle of the stage at Sacred Heart and Why? go to sleep. Because what? then I had ownership of the stage. Wow. That's very interesting. It wasn't that you didn't have a place to sleep. It's just that you wanted to feel like that was yours. That, yeah, that was that was my home. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, well, speaking of Sacred Heart, um, yeah. you know, I understand that there's a scene in Cheers where you used a skill that you may have picked up at Shoe. Do we have that clip to show? Or drinking? <laughs> I'm not going to get a splinter. And? Thing, I? <laughs> just keep a good grip on that, Normie. You know, Cliff, you're really crazy. This thing is solid. Yeah, it's just the way I like it, Carla. Solid. Goodbye to you all forever. Come on back in here and let us set you up, huh? Please, come back. All right. All right, but I'd like to have a little word with Diane here first. Oh. All right. All right. <laughs> Diane, uh, look, I've never taken a karate lesson in my life. <laughs> you get me to a hospital quick. <laughs> 
we just watched that episode. My husband and I are streaming from season one. Uh, Coach is still there. That's where we are. But um, that made us that made me laugh out loud again, just seeing that again. So tell me about karate and its connection to shoe for you. Well, uh, I was on the. I don't know if you still have karate there, but Bob Bodwin, who's Grandmaster Bob Bodwin, he actually just passed away this past February. He started the uh, karate class at Sacred Heart. And Sacred Heart was, uh, I think, one of the first colleges to have a full-blown karate tournament. Uh, I'm getting a nodding confirmation that that's true from the producer. Yeah, so that was history. And, and if, you, if, if there still isn't one there, there should be, because Sacred Heart started it all. That particular style with Tang Sudo and uh, also was another uh, notable Shu alum, Jim Shannon. Uh, was on the on the team as well, and uh, he's he's a he's a he's a boyhood buddy. We've been hanging out since third grade, but uh, and he uh, he runs the uh, psychological services for the Bridgeport school system now. Wow! So, so there's have, there's. Go ahead, if sorry. Have, if you have any crazy kids, just drop drop them off at his house. <laughs> It's but, good to uh, know. We were, I've I've got a couple, so that's good. But we were we were uh, on the team, and that's where I, and then I learned karate. Then you know once I it was older and and uh, I introduced my children to it and trained again and uh, so. But the interesting thing to me of that whole episode with Cheers was that the producer came to me and said, "Don't worry, John." We're, we're going to get a stuntman to do this for you. And I said, "We, you don't need a stuntman. I, I could do this. Uh, and they laughed. They went, oh, sure. <laughs> and that's when I realized that in Hollywood, they don't see you as the person. They see you as the character you play. And so I, I realized at that moment that the uh, producer, the, the, the boss, uh, thought that I really was Cliff. And so the next day in rehearsal, I brought in some wooden bricks or whatever it was, and I showed him. I said, I, I need to show you this because I don't think you believe me. And then I did it during rehearsal, and then they went, oh, okay. So I did it for myself on camera. Uh, to what wow. you saw is, was actually me doing it. And But it was interesting to me that why wouldn't they take my word for it? Then I realized because they think they're talking to Cliff. It's a town of pigeonholing. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of shoe, and we could talk about karate and all, you know, there's so much to talk about here, but I would like to bring in a guest person and uh, she is just about to graduate or maybe this weekend would have been graduation. I don't know. Things are so up in the air. Um, Denny, are you with us? I am. I'm here. Hey, Denny. Denny Rodriguez. She is a member of the class of 2020. And boy, she's, the she's, a, she's, a, she's got a bright future. She's student council president. She's been a leader throughout all four years at SHU, including as a member of the Division I women's rowing team here at SHU. And I understand that you have that in common, right? John and Denny. Denny, I'll let you, do you have any questions for John about philanthropy or his time at SHU? And then John, I'm gonna to wanna to know if you have advice for Denny. So Denny, why don't you go first? Um, I do, I mean, I have a million questions, but I mean, <laughs> one thing that I would love to ask and um, being that I spend most of my time at SHU is what was SHU like when, like when you went to school there? There was still a lot of dirt. Uh, because, you know, there was, it was just starting. It had been, that building was the Notre Dame uh, High School and the building that we inhabited. But, uh, I, you know, where you have dorms up on the hill and the, that diner and the football field, I mean, that was still uncharted territory. There was, uh, you know, Davy Crockett was still going in there looking for bears and... <laughs> Bring, bringing home some venison. Uh, I mean, it was wilderness. But uh, it was, let's see, yeah, it was, um, 
John Crawfee was the he was the uh, admissions counselor, dean of admissions, and, and then Bill Dean was was part of that, and um, Dr. O'Sullivan was the president. And uh, boy, but look at you now! I mean, what a I, I'm I'm impressed. I'm a hard guy to impress, but Sacred Heart impresses me very very much. Especially, I didn't even know you had a rowing team because I'm yeah. a rower. I, I that's I, I grew up doing that, not in competition, just to uh, get, you know get out of the house, I guess. But I grew up on Black Rock Harbor, so I had a rowboat before I had a bicycle. I just still love rowing. And, yeah. Yeah. What? How many? How many people in your boat? In your? I row in a four, so I row in a four or an eight. So I rode both positions. Um, but I heard that you. How far do you travel? To competitions yeah. or. Um, well, we go for spring training every year for uh, Florida, which is so much fun. Um, but we pretty much stay in the tri-state area. No kidding. Has COVID-19 affected your travel and your training, Denny? Um, well, actually, we were very lucky because we go for spring training um, during spring break. So we actually got to go away to Florida. And then when we came back that Monday, we were told that we don't have school any longer. So sadly, we're all we're all home right now. I am a graduating senior, so I definitely didn't get my last race, didn't get my last chance to say goodbye to the water or any of that. But it's definitely been hard on all of us because of that. Yeah, I mean, COVID-19, and I'm, I, I know you have a few more questions, but it's a good time to bring this up, that obviously COVID-19 has affected us all. It's it's affected a lot of SHU students in big ways and small ways, and, and there is a student emergency fund that helps the pioneers who are, who are facing challenges, and they are many, including housing and transportation, just basic needs. Some don't have the resources for online learning and more. Some of the graduate students have lost part-time jobs that help them pay their rent and tuition. I mean, we have yet to see how this plays out. And the parents of our students are out of work. And some in the community, it's not even about tuition. They're, they're struggling with basic needs. And so the Student Emergency Fund really helps the students with them. Uh, do you know anything more that you can add about that, Denny? This is part of what we're raising money for today is the Student Emergency Fund. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, being a student myself, I am graduating from SHU, and it's definitely given me a lot of help tremendously. So I would only hope that people would, that this fund would be able to help others, especially because we have no idea how badly this is going to still affect many. Yeah. What else did you want to ask John about his days at, at SHU? It was just a commuter college back then, right, John? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, there might have been people sleeping in their cars for all I know. but Or on the stage. <laughs> Yeah, I know there was one at least. <laughs> well, I guess the uh, pioneer symbol of Sacred Heart had a, a bigger effect on me than I realized because that's how I've lived my life. Like, it's a big adventure. Well, here's an unknown territory here. Let's let's go check it out. Let's figure out what's going on behind those trees. And uh, it's so far, it's worked out. So thank you, Sacred Heart. Sounds and great. Thank you, and uh, everybody there that's uh, been a big part of my life. Uh, like I said before, Ray Hassett, Jim Shannon, uh, my fraternity brothers, the Pantadelphians. Uh, oh, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. But thank you. I'm Randy Kay, and thank you so much for joining me for this interview with the wonderful John Ratzenberger. It is Giving Tuesday, and so you can always help out. Just visit sacredheart.edu forward slash help a pioneer, and that money goes to the Student Emergency Fund. You can also text SHU Gives to 41444. And to find out more about SHU and additional ways to give and things that are going on, it's sacredheart.edu slash stay connected. And finally, you can support WSHU by visiting WSHU.org, look for the donate button, or by calling 800-777-9748. Thanks a lot. 
Our public service mission is to ensure that WSHU is a trusted and essential source for news, music, culture, and more. I'm station manager Rima Dael. During this difficult time, we have refocused our resources towards giving you the latest critical information about the COVID-19 pandemic as well as soothing classical music. Thank you for being there for us by listening and by supporting WSHU Public Radio.